Welcome back, everyone, to another edition of the Prove Me Wrong podcast. As always, I'm your host, Pete Lieb. I'm glad you are joining me today. It is a Halloween week here on the show, and while nothing really in my recent memory has been as scary as this entire year has been so far, I'm going to forge ahead with the show that I wanted and what I originally planned tonight. In my household, Halloween is the favorite holiday of the year. Well, I mean, we love the haunted houses. We watch a full month of scary movies. We do trick-or-treat, costume parties. It gets no more fun at our house to us. We just decorated the house today. And I know a lot of people who feel this way also, but it begs the question to me anyway, how do we get to this point? What was the history of Halloween, the origins, and the evolution from that into what it is today? To help educate me and you tonight on all things Halloween, I'm very fortunate to have author Lisa Morton join me and discuss her book, Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween. Lisa is a screenwriter, author of nonfiction books, and award-winning prose writer whose work was described by the American Library Association's Reader's Advisory Guide to Horror as consistently dark, unsettling, and frightening, which sounds perfect for us tonight. She is the author of four novels and 150 short stories, a six-time winner of Bram Stoker's award, uh, and one of them being Trick or Treat. Lisa really owns the award. They should almost just rename it. She is a world-class Halloween expert. Her most recent books are, include the anthology Weird Women, classic supernatural fiction by ground, groundbreaking female writers, 1852 to 1923, and Calling the Spirits, A History of Seances, and set to release in May 2021 is the collection Night Terrors and Other Tales. You can find more about Lisa on her website, uh, lisamorton.com, and she's also on Facebook, she's on Twitter, and you can find her books on amazon.com. So with all of that, I want to welcome Lisa to the show. Hi, Lisa. How are you? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me, and happy Halloween, everyone. Yes, I've got my... Uh, I got my my skeleton shirt on. I'm ready to go. It's as close as I can get. I was going to do the whole makeup, but man, that was going to take a while. So right. if you could, could you start me off with some of the background and why you decided that horror, the horror genre was the one for you? Um, it's something I just always loved. And I, I always like to say that I had incredibly indulgent parents who I think actually secretly loved it too, because yeah. we used to watch monster movies when I was a kid. My dad would help me make Aurora monster models. And um, both of my parents were uh, very helpful when we got around to Halloween every year. They would help me make my costumes and we would all decorate. And it was it was a big holiday for us. Have you ever, ha have you ever had a paranormal experience? Was there something like that that kind of kick-started you into the love of, of scary things? Not then. I have had some sort of minor but very interesting experiences as an adult but as a kid no nothing like that have you ever gone on a on a uh, like paranormal hunt or an investigation of any kind oh yes i have yeah my um my book uh, ghost of haunted history i certainly delved into a number of paranormal investigations for that um i've done them in the queen mary i've done them oh. at the stanley hotel in colorado yeah i've been to some pretty interesting ones and just nothing in any of those situations that you thought you couldn't you couldn't explain away or you couldn't debunk. There was one. There was one at the Stanley Hotel that was that was really strange, um, and it came via a spirit box. Which, if people don't know what that is, it's a little device that looks like a radio. Um, in fact, I've got one here. It's mm -hmm. this thing. It scans radio frequencies very quickly, and the idea is that spirits who are trying to communicate can use electromagnetic uh, radiation or frequency or energy to create words within that spectrum. And um, I was at the Stanley Hotel on an all-night investigation. It was three in the morning. We were out in one of the side buildings, the concert hall, if anyone knows the Stanley. Um, it was cold. The wind yeah. was howling. We were in darkness up in the balcony. So the whole scene was set, but really nothing had happened. And the spirit box was sitting there on the edge of the balcony, just going through its, usually it just sounds like white static. And at one point it blurted out a word that sounded exactly like Mostelaria. 
And what's interesting about this is at the time I was researching my book, Ghost of Haunted History. Mm -hmm. And a few months before I arrived at the Stanley, I had been researching ghost in the classical world. And there's a very famous Roman play, the title of which translates to a haunted house, but the original Latin title is Mostelaria. Now, I would have certainly <laughs> been the only person there that night who knew what that was. Yeah. There were other people there who heard this word, had no idea what it was. Um, and I cannot imagine anyone having said that on a radio station at three in the morning in Colorado. So I, that is the weirdest experience I've ever had. Um, do you scare easily? I mean, was it something that, did you even hear it at the time or, um, well, I guess you did, right? It was on the spirit box. So you would have heard it when it happened. And so right. did you recognize that right away and, and you've made that connection? Did it frighten you at all? Does, are you the kind of person who gets frightened like that? I don't get frightened very easily. For one thing, I find all these things incredibly interesting. Yeah. I, I'm kind of a natural skeptic, but I'm one of those skeptics who would love to be convinced. Um, so to me, that was fascinating. And it's one of those things where, because I'm a bit skeptical by nature, I start thinking, did I, was that actually something else? And my brain just made it into most Delaria? I mean, what was that? And, um, there were other aspects of that evening that were a little frightening. There was a one point we were down in the basement of this concert hall and the basement is supposed to be very haunted. And we were in a completely pitch dark room. And everything went nuts all at once. I mean, EMF meters were going nuts. And um, people, the guy sitting next to me started shouting, I'm being touched, something is touching me. And, you know, when you're already a little tired and cold, that gets a little unnerving. Uh-huh, no doubt. Uh, I know that that's usually how things go. A lot of times that uh, some experience like that will guide somebody into that, that lifelong journey. And I... I know I had, I've mentioned it many, many times, I have a lot of paranormal uh, podcasts. I kind of mix them in. I mix in serial killers and podcast and uh, paranormal and conspiracy theories and some health and well. I kind of little do a little bit of everything. But when I was young, uh, I had a couple. My aunt's house was significantly, severely haunted. And it wasn't just me having a, 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 an individual event. There were multiple people who witnessed it at the same time, and so that's always really good evidence when you can when there are three people there at the same time who are witnessing the same thing, and you can you know you can confirm it together. But that always sparked my curiosity and imagination from that point on. I was twelve or thirteen at the time, and it scared the heck out of me. I mean, I'll be honest, it scared the crap out of me at that age. But it, at that, I think now, being more mature and, and older. It is just more interesting to me. Now I, I just really want to, you know, my daughter and my wife and I will go to, we live in North Florida right now, Northeast Florida. So we live in maybe an hour and a half from Savannah. We've gone to Savannah and, and gone to some of the, the hotels there and did little ghost hunts. And we've gone to St. Augustine and the lighthouses and done ghost hunts there. It's just fun to us. So um, you just never know. I guess a lot of people hope that there is something after life you know they, they believe that there is they hope that there is and and so that's always something people want to confirm you know they can if we think there are ghosts that means we can confirm potentially that there's something more after this this phase so it's it's i don't know i don't know what your, th your thoughts on that but um i find that usually somebody has some type of experience and that kind of drives them that way um what so for trick-or-treat you wrote a history of halloween what made you decide that I needed a, to write a history of Halloween? It, I, I wish I could say this was like some lifelong obsession yeah. that I finally indulged in all the way. But uh, the truth is it started back in the early 2000s. Um, I had just finished a film book for a publisher and they said to me, would you like to do another book with us? And so I looked at their current um, catalog of books that they had published recently and they had just done a Christmas encyclopedia. And I obviously always loved Halloween. Um, like I said, it wasn't necessarily an obsession at that point, but it was something that I was interested in enough that I thought, oh, you know what? Nobody's done a Halloween encyclopedia. So uh, I proposed that and they accepted it. And um, I always laugh and say, for some reason, I thought it was going to be easy to put that together. It was basically three years of incredibly hard work yeah. um, and when you're doing an encyclopedia you're trying to gather as much inf information as you can and 
in the course of doing that, I got so much great stuff that it was easy to roll it over into other books after the encyclopedia. So what was what are some of the, the earliest references that you could find in that three-year uh, re- reference period? What could you find of what Halloween would eventually become? Where do you think the origins were? There, that's an interesting question because there's a little debate on that. Some scholars believe that it goes all the way back to the Celtic holiday of Samhain, um, mm-hmm. but there's another stream that thinks that it stems almost entirely from the Catholic holiday of All Saints Day, which of course is celebrated on November 1st. So the the night before is the Eve, which is where we get the name All Hallows Eve, and uh, I fall in that former camp. I I absolutely believe it dates back to the Celtic Samhain holiday. And the the reason I believe that is because of the macabre nature of the holiday. I think that comes from the Celtic um, celebration, which was their New Year's. And because it was their time between two different years, it was also a time when they thought the veil between worlds was at its thinnest. They believed in very malicious uh, fairies, which they called the she, and the she could cross over into our world on that one night and wreak all kinds of terrible havoc. And they told ghost stories about it. We have some of those recorded by the early Christian missionaries to Ireland. Um, And I I just see too much of our sort of macabre belief in ghosts and spirits and so forth um, that are part of Halloween that go along with that Samhain. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas All Saints Day, there isn't a lot of really macabre stuff associated with it. You get a little bit of that association with All Souls Day, which follows on November 2nd. Um, And that was about souls being trapped in limbo. And so there was a little bit of macabre stuff with that, but not nearly what you got with Samhain. Were there uh, ceremonies held on All Souls Day, or what? I mean, were there um, celebrations held? What, what What do those days entail? All Saints Day, All Souls Day. What were they doing at that time? With All Saints Day, people would typically go on November first to the graveyard, and they would clean the uh, graves or the tombstones of their deceased loved ones. Um, so it was a very sort of somber, somewhat. Uh, melancholy day. Mm -hmm. Um, With All Souls Day, there were some interesting traditions, which sound a little bit like parts of modern Halloween. There was a practice called souling, where uh, beggars and then later on kids painted up as beggars, covered in grime and wearing old clothes, would go from house to house and they would offer a prayer for the souls of your loved ones trapped in purgatory in exchange for either money or a little treat. Um, So souling is a little bit like trick-or-treat although there really is technically no direct line from uh between them when did uh when did we start making this into just kind of a more of a generic celebration of i mean halloween to me always kind of speaks to people being able to access something different they can be they can access their dark side they can just be someone different for the night they can make, you know, it gives them an opportunity to kind of escape the life that they're actually living and be someone else or be something else. When did we start that transition to, it's just really, it's, it's a party. It's an opportunity for you to, to be someone else. It's an opportunity for you to go out and and uh, and trick or treat or, or have a uh, campfire and tell ghost stories. When did we start making that transition? Yeah, I think you can kind of date that from the 70s, because in the 70s, there were a number of groups that sort of started to co-opt Halloween for themselves. Um, Up until then, it had been mainly a children's holiday with trick-or-treat and so Mm -hmm. forth. But in the 70s, you get counterculture groups like um, LGBTQ groups or uh, neo-pagan and pagan groups taking this holiday and saying, you know, we don't think it should just belong to the kids. We want to celebrate it too. And then that conversion kind of, to me, gets brought full circle in 1978 when John Carpenter puts out Halloween, the movie, which finally firmly situates this holiday as something that is very spooky and is for adults. And from that point on, we start to see that humongous growth in the haunted attractions industry and people doing up their their homes as sort Mm -hmm. of small versions of haunts. And we get that huge explosion of like, creativity and 
in costuming and in haunts and in your yard your yard displays so before that it really wasn't uh, i always got the impression that it was kind of always tied to a cult activity or uh, some nefarious actions going on but you basically up until that point uh, it wasn't really that way that it, you say it kind of started at, at that point where we said okay um you know that, that were really the horror aspect of halloween came in yeah, the, the sort of a cult tie mm -hmm. um, didn't exist hugely before that. Um, I From around the end of the 19th century up until those 1970s, it really was primarily thought of as a children's um, holiday. And in fact, it even lost much of its Catholic meaning. Um, in the 1950s, they removed, the, there used to be a huge celebration around it called an octave. They got rid of that in the 50s. It became much more of a lay holiday from the 50s on. And it was something that had been heavily marketed towards children in trick-or-treating. The ca candy companies, costume companies came in, um, made it a big marketing thing. And marketing and retailing has been incredibly important to this, this holiday. And another one of the reasons that you see it shifting after that and becoming a more adult holiday is in the mid eighties, the Coors Brewing Company decides they need something to compete with Super Bowl Sunday. And they actually looked at the existing holidays and tried to figure out which one they could sort of take over and they came up with Halloween. And a lot of people may not remember that the first spokesperson for Coors was not Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, and the beer didn't sell very well. It wasn't until they brought her in in about 87 that their sales went insane. Mm -hmm. And at that point, thanks to Elvira, we get a lot of that adult partying uh, aspect of the holiday. I know, at least where I live here, um, the parents uh, party just as much as the kids. I mean, to the to the parent. I mean, honestly, there are. I don't know if it's if it's legal or not, but the you know my neighborhood will have four hundred kids coming by, and their parents will be walking pat with a tray of some type of al alcohol shot or something. And so it's it's literally the the kids would get a treat, and then the parents would give the people who gave the treat a treat. It's it's super weird. So the whole neighborhood is just hey, let's give the kids candy and let's give each other alcohol. I don't know when it became. Wow. Yeah, I mean it's it's a party over here for sure. Um, so, uh, when did are there other places around the world? I mean, is is Halloween kind of universal at this point like that, or is it still, or is it bigger in America than in other places? It's still biggest in America, and what's interesting about its global growth is that up until 15 years ago, you didn't see it being celebrated anywhere outside of the U.S. and the British Isles. Um, now you get this holiday being celebrated all over at least the northern hemisphere, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Um, and uh, you get... Um, for example, Japan, it's become huge there. And of course, they love costumes. Yeah, they yeah. love putting their kids in colorful things and having parades. So that kind of figures. But seeing it in places like Russia and in many parts of Europe, they now celebrate Halloween alongside All Saints Day. They, they have them as two separate holidays. Um, it's still waiting to catch on more in the Southern Hemisphere because the seasonal uh, side of it is gone there. The seasons are flipped. Um, October 31st is not harvest time mm -hmm. in the Southern Hemisphere, but we are starting to see it catch on hugely in places like Australia and um, in uh, South Africa. So I think we're going to see it continue to spread around the world. And, and in places like Central America, I mean, they also have the, the Day of the Dead and things like that, right? They also have other celebrations that are celebrating the death of loved ones that may not necessarily coincide with with uh, Halloween right so they kind of have something else already that fills that void um, so was it you know were these initial celebrations way back in the day were they kind of timed with the harvest cycle I mean it, it, it makes sense that the the seasons start to change things start to die you know trees start to go the colors start to change on the trees the leaves fall off the trees so it is this transition from the life of summer to kind of the death of winter. Was that was that part of it? I mean, was that from what your research showed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for the Celts with Samhain in particular, 
It was the time when they finished their harvest, when they brought their livestock in from the fields, when they kind of knuckled down for the long winter that was coming. So I, it has definitely, I think, always had that harvest angle part of it. You know, and I saw a movie, um, and it's actually, it, it's technically, I guess, considered a Christmas movie, Meet Me in St. Louis. But the whole, the whole year is encompassed in the movie, so they have quite a, a few holidays. And uh, I actually watched it for the first full time last year. And I was surprised by the Halloween portion of the movie because the kids weren't trick or treating. They were pranking and they were destroying things. And uh, I was uh, and I wanted you to speak on it. I was kind of surprised to learn that they didn't actually get treats at that point. They just kind of went around and, and pulled pranks and destroyed things. And, and that seems so shocking to me because I, you know, because I, I didn't know that until I saw that movie that that's what Halloween used to be for for kids. When did the treats yeah. come involved? When get involved? Yeah, that's actually a really good, accurate portrayal of it. That's also one of the first appearances of the holiday on film. Yeah. Um, and uh, it that's where we get trick or treat from. People love to think that trick or treat goes back like hundreds of years, or you'll hear ridiculous stories about oh, the ancient druids did yeah. it. No, they did not. Um, it is fairly recent. It did stem from buying off these pranksters um, up until about 1935. Um, Halloween was celebrated with pranking. It was mainly these young boys who yeah. would go out and they would do at first harmless things like tip over an outhouse or um, a big prank they loved to play was stealing a gate. And they, this was so common that the holiday actually was called gate night in places. Um, and, but then as America becomes more urbanized and the cities are becoming bigger, these pranksters start moving into the cities. And when they do that, it becomes very destructive. Mm -hmm. They're breaking light fixtures. They're setting things on fire. And by 1933, when we're in the midst of the Great Depression, a lot of cities were actually thinking of banning the holiday because this had gotten so out of hand. It was costing cities millions of dollars. But fortunately, a few cooler heads prevailed and said, you know, we might be more successful if we buy these kids off. Yeah. And That's amazing, yeah. right? How easy that was. Let, let's give them something to make them stop doing it. It's amazing uh, th yeah. that th the logic on that, rather than just saying, let's cancel everything and, and cut it out completely. They pivoted. I mean, that shows some, some real outside the box thinking to me that let's pivot and reward them for not destroying things. Exactly. And not only did they figure out to do this, they did it in a very um, organized way. They um, created party pamphlets that they would distribute to homeowners. And these pamphlets would detail how to hold a party. And they would be things like give the kids costumes, give the kids little treats. Um, yeah, it was kind of very smart, very well done. And it worked like gangbusters. Yeah. Um, by 1936, you start finding articles on this in national magazines in the U.S. There's a very famous one that is headlined, um, uh, A Victim of the Window Soaping Brigade. And it talks about how this homeowner bought these kids off with giving them apple cider and donuts and that whole bit. And um, so by the time you, it takes a little bit of a, recess during the war because sugar was uh, rationed and people couldn't get a lot of these things. But by the time you get past World War II, trick or treat is here to stay. Um, and at that point, the candy companies, the costume companies come in and say to mom, hey, you don't have to spend your whole day making treats for these kids or their costumes. Mm -hmm. Here you go. And it really is institutionalized from then on. If you see some of the, well, I'm sure you have, but I mean, when you show some pictures of some of the costumes these kids made in the 30s and 40s, they are terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> they are so scary. These, you know, I'm used to, I'm a child of the 70s, so I'm used to, well, we all had those plastic masks. You know, that was the big thing in the 70s, the plastic mask that just covered the first front half of your face and then that, that smock that kind of went down in front of you. And but I would I looked back and saw some black and white pictures of these kids who had made their own and they were they were scary. They were really <laughs> scary uh, costumes. And I mean, I remember when I was a kid, it seemed like the, the grown ups in my neighborhood made us earn it. I mean, they made us earn going to the door and getting candy. I mean, it was scary as hell to get up there. Uh, I remember very clearly there was a um, we would we were 
trick-or-treating and there was a house that was built actually there was a small um, little creek in front of it and they had a little bridge that went over to the house you had to go over this bridge to get to the house and that dude was under the bridge every year in one of those old he had an old man mask on and you know it was like an um it almost looked like uh the guy from um to kill a mockingbird you know the, the the bad guy from to kill a mockingbird um that that guy and he would come out and he would scare the hell out of the kids but then you know, just as you were about to run away he would pull the bucket up and put the bucket on the bridge and let you get the candy but he made you earn it and and i know um and that stuck with me and i used to well before we moved into a neighborhood with very small children i would make those kids earn it you know they had to come up and i was scary and the house was kind of it was really scary but uh you know how much is that candy worth to you that was a <laughs> That that guy that was exciting to me, but, um, but yeah, like I said, now it's it's more a, a party, and and we have a, a much younger neighborhood, so you, you gotta, you know, I change with the times, you know, but um, so you are also a very a very successful horror writer and actually a screenwriter, which I mentioned previously. Um, do you watch horror movies during the? I'm sure I'm sure you love probably horror movies. I know we watch them. We we try to watch one basically one a night and up until from October 1st till Halloween. What are your favorite types of horror movies? Do you have a favorite type? Um, I don't know if I have a favorite type. I kind of love all horror movies. Yeah. Um, I, during the Halloween season, if I have time, which I often don't because it's my busiest month of the True. year. Um, if I had the, the time, I would, probably watch a lot of the old universal classics again i love those um frankenstein dracula mm -hmm. creature from the black lagoon the wolfman the mummy those are all great um i uh but i also love a lot of stuff from i mean my all-time favorite movie is the exorcist um that's the movie that made me want to be oh, a writer yeah um so super I scary watch, somebody let me yeah. somebody for some reason i was born in 73 and for some reason someone let me watch that movie in like 1980 you know and uh i was way too young to watch that yeah. movie in 1980 and i honestly I, i'm telling you i was i think i was spending some time with my cousin and, and my cousins my aunt and uncle and i did not go upstairs for two weeks just didn't go up there no under no circumstance was i going upstairs at night and uh, you know I, I i don't know what we were thinking but it, that it probably is the scariest movie to this day i don't i don't know many things that have really held up as well as that movie has even today you know usually you watch like if you watch poltergeist the steven spielberg movie and you get you see it nowadays and the movie's still fabulous but you can see that the the special effects aren't quite what they would be now but right. uh, but the movie was still so good and I, but i remember it as a child and it, it was scared the crap out of me so i just uh, i was wondering if you you know being a horror writer being have that you know writing screenplays and things like that uh, if you had a specific genre you know zombies or or vampires or things like that that you enjoyed i don't know but i like i said we watch we go through um we go through phases so we'll go i mean i'm on a zombie phase i for some reason and because theaters go through phases they'll have you'll have 10 years of, of vampires then 10 years of zombies then 10 years of ghost movies ouija boards things like that um so what is um, your favorite book? I mean, you are a writer of, of horror books. Do you have a favorite horror book of your own? Um, hmm. My favorite horror book is probably a collection of short stories, actually. Yeah. Um, my favorite horror author is a guy named Dennis Etchison. He is not incredibly well known, but he was a local LA writer, uh, just passed away last year. And uh, he was really a master of the short story, which is my favorite form to write in. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first read him in the early 80s, um, somebody gave me this this book to read, this collection of short stories, because I actually had met him recently. And I said, oh, I, he seems like an interesting guy. I'd like to read his work. And it was the kind of thing where you just, you read it and you immediately go, oh my God, this is exactly the kind of stuff that's been in my head that... Um, I can't believe somebody got this so right on paper. And uh, many of his stories are set in LA. I'm a li lifelong um, native of Southern California, mm -hmm. especially LA. Um, and it just felt so right and so home at home to me that um, it was really a, an incredible experience to read those stories for the first time. Did you ever feel odd 
uh, sometimes people have, you know, they, they kind of say, I write this kind of books and they're in these horror books and I feel kind of odd. I feel maybe like I'm not normal for writing those type of things. Uh, and I used to write a lot of little horror short stories myself. Like I said, I've always been very interested in it. But then you kind of think to yourself, I don't know if you ever had a moment where you thought, am I normal? Am I, am I typical? Am I okay? Or you know, these thoughts that are going through my head, uh, are they, are they normal to have? Or do you ever find yourself kind of doubting yourself like that? Oddly enough, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably um, good. That's probably right. I, what you get a lot of, if, especially I think if you're female, is you get a lot of people who say, really, you don't look like someone who would write oh. horror. And um, I guess people must have this image of us all looking either like big, tall, hairy yeah. Stephen King or like, you know, Glenn Danzig or something. And um, it's sort of fun to, to shock those expectations a little bit, I think. Well, some people, it's all about the, the image and they, they live the lifestyle. And some people are just really, in, you know, into the content. You know, some people, I love the content, but I don't need to go through, you know, all the rigmarole of, of making myself look that way all the time. Right. So I get yeah. it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So in your book, is there something in your book that um, would be a misconception? What are the misconceptions about Halloween that you think that, that might be in your book that people wouldn't know about that you would be changing their mind? Um, to me, one of the biggest ones is this notion that it is based on an ancient, ancient Celtic worship of a lord of death. And there, this is often actually spelled out as the, the Celts worshipped a lord of death named Samhain, or as it's frequently mispronounced, Samhain, mm -hmm. um, which of course has now become a character in a million Halloween stories. But um, I, when I was writing my book, Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween, I really wanted to track down where does this very strange mistaken conception come from? Because scholars all over the world and throughout history acknowledge that Samhain means summer's end. That's the literal translation of it. It does not, there was no Lord of Death in Celtic mm -hmm. um, mythology or religion. Where did this come from? And I actually found an exact moment in history where that came from. Um, at the uh, end of the 16th century, there was a gentleman named Charles Valency. Um, actually, I'm sorry, a little bit later than that, but this fellow was a surveyor who was sent by Her Majesty over to Ireland to map. Ireland. He was there for 12 years and he became obsessed with Celtic history and lore and he collected everything he could on it and he wrote it all down and his writings cover thousands and thousands of words and he published a six volume collection of his Celtic writings um, and there was just one problem with this. He was a complete and utter idiot, frankly. <laughs> um, he was a guy who just arbitrarily decided that things did not mean what they meant. And with Samhain, he thought it sounded like the name of an Indian Lord of Death named Saman. And so he just decided, no, it doesn't mean summer's end, it means Lord of Death. Well, even though at the time he was completely denounced on this thinking and his books were, received awful reviews, they still found their way into libraries all over the world. And it created what I think of as this strange alternate history of Halloween where it involves the worship of a Lord of Death. But the fact is, even though, um, and what makes me crazy is all the Christian groups who have used that since then to um, turn the holiday into something that it's mm -hmm. not. Um, it really is not based on a satanic worship of a Celtic Lord of Death. That was the mistake of a terrible would-be historian. And it's amazing how one misinterpretation like that, and again, it can be debunked all day long, but if it finds the right root, that can grow into something that, you know, everybody is now plucking the fruit off of that tree. And, right. and you're right. It is one person who made one bad error in um, in the way that they um, interpreted something and then all of a sudden it, it's gone from there and now the you know it, it used to be it's, it was a harvest festival essentially it was a, a festival of the harvest we're gonna we're gonna get together we're gonna celebrate the end of the, the summer we're gonna harvest our food together we're gonna you know have some neighborly conversations and now it is we are worshiping uh, a satanic figure um, right and we're gonna tie it to the underworld and tie it to to death and, and everything else uh, so it, it, that's pretty funny. I don't, I don't 
but but it happens all the time. I mean, this is not, and especially nowadays in the internet age, you can basically make up anything you want, put it on on the <laughs> internet, and somebody will believe it. You know, millions right. of people will believe it because they can see it immediately, uh, so which is not great. But um, so, are there any um, anything else in terms of uh, you know, you've also worked on uh, a collection of stories, right? In the past, you've done collection of Halloween stories. Are there any of uh, one story in particular that you kind of found was your favorite story that's centered around Halloween? Um, I think a couple of the first ones I did remain among my favorites. Uh -huh. um, there was um, one I did called the Shamana, which is based on a little tiny tidbit of actual history that I found once that there may have been a sort of Scottish um, Halloween goblin that uh, would come out on Halloween night and it was called the Shamanak. And I, I thought that was such an interesting name and an mm -hmm. interesting idea that I created a novella around that. I brought it into contemporary times and I had this thing as a shapeshifter that could take um, sort of the ultimate Halloween costumer, I guess, and could take on the guise of different people and trick them into doing terrible things on Halloween night. Um, I was really happy with how that turned out. Um, and then also one of the first short stories that I wrote on the holiday um, was something I was really proud of called The Devil Came to Mamie's on Halloween. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was based on my partner at the time was obsessed with early female blues singers. And he was um, listening nonstop to Bessie Smith and all kinds of these incredible singers while I was working on my Halloween stuff. and. I thought it would be interesting to combine those two. So I did a story that involved a lot of Southern regional uh, Halloween folklore and put a young female blues singer into the middle of it. And I, I was really happy with how that came out. So my last question then for you tonight is, I, what are you doing? You know, you're, you're highly, you're a Halloween expert. You're definitely engrossed in this genre and kind of field of work. What does your Halloween month look like? What are you doing during the Halloween uh, period, um, whether it be for work or, or things that you just like to do personally? Well, of course, it, it's my busiest month of the year. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing a lot of interviews and presentations and panels and so forth. But um, the thing that I like to do for fun, we love to do a, our own little tiny yard haunt. Um, we are going ahead with it this year, despite what's happening in the world, because we love doing it for ourselves. Yeah. It's, it's a fun, creative act. It's almost like creating your own little magical fantasy kingdom. We always do a haunted graveyard. Um, so we, we redesigned it mildly this year, so it could be better viewed just from the street. Um, but we're working on that right now and having a lot of fun with it. We just really love doing that every year. Do you have any type of like, I mean, some people are, are collectors. Do you happen to collect any type of haunted artifacts or things like that that you may have around the house that people may send you or, you know, fans may, uh, you know, give give to you or, or things like that? Um, I'd love to have haunted <laughs> artifacts. That would be great. But um, in terms of like Halloween material, I, I probably the thing I most like to collect is vintage postcards. Uh-huh. Um, from about 1910 to about 1930, there were around oh, 3,500 vintage Halloween postcards that were made. They're absolutely gorgeous, many of them. They have beautiful art. And um, I originally started buying a few of them because I needed illustration materials for my books. But then I just loved them so much, I just kind of kept buying them. And um, so that's my favorite thing to collect. Well, um Thank you so much for, for joining the show tonight, Lisa. As I mentioned, you know, during the intro, you have you have um, another collection coming out in May of 2021. Is that still on track so far? I know that uh, you know with things going going kind of sideways this year. I don't know if that is also still on track. Is there anything else that you'd like to plug that you have going on? Um, yeah, as far as I know, that is still uh, scheduled to happen. I'm supposed to be a guest of honor at StokerCon in Denver next May. That's where we're going to launch the collection. So we keep our fingers crossed that that will proceed. Um, and then just uh, last week, I had this book come out. I'll plug this right now. This is my book on the history of seances. Yes. Um, so it's been really fun to have that come out. And um, I'm 
beyond that, there are a couple of really cool things that are in the works that I really can't talk about quite yet. Yes. But hopefully soon. Well, uh, I look forward to hopefully I look forward to talking to you about the seances. I think those are actually fascinating. I have a, a ton of uh, questions about that as well, especially with regard to things like uh, you know the Ouija boards and, and different devices that you use to make contact because those things scare the hell out of me. And I, I have a I don't know if it's a rational fear or irrational fear, but I have one. I definitely I mean, I've actually had a woman on who does the Ouija board professionally on the show and um I, I didn't want to believe her when she was saying, oh, it's all about how you use it. If you use it respectfully, it'll work for you. It's like, I don't, I don't know if I believe you. But uh, so I have a, a lot of, of good questions about that. But uh, I thank you so much for, for joining the show tonight and talking to me about, you know, again, some of the, the origins of the Halloween holiday, uh, some of the things that, that you have, some of the, you know, just kind of the whole thing. I enjoy it very much. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, hopefully we can, uh, we'll do it again soon. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank and you. thanks a lot for having me on today. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks, you too. Thanks. So that's Lisa Morton. And again, we, we talk about uh, the origin of Halloween. And again, there are some things in there that um, you may not know about, right? It didn't always start as a, as a party. You know, like I said, it, it's morphed into more of a party. It's morphed into more of a, hey, let's hang out and we'll dress, you know, like the uh, sexy cop or or some murder victim, what have you. But ultimately, we'll, we'll go around, we'll have a good time, we'll have a party, we'll, we'll share drinks and treats, and the kids will go out and trick-or-treat, and it'll be fun. But it had a more practical purpose back in the day. You know, there was more practical purpose in terms of bringing in the harvest, uh, celebrating the changing of the season, celebrating another good, uh, another good year, uh, stockpiling uh, food. It was interesting to me also to find that how uh, we got into the idea of somehow or another this is a, this is an occult or this is a a um, horror dominated holiday versus just a celebration of a changing of a season. Um, so I don't and I don't know what you think. Halloween is my favorite holiday of the year, hands down, without a doubt. So um, what do you think out there? Is it or is it one of your favorite holidays as well? What do you do on Halloween? You can contact us. Through our Gmail account, it's prove me wrongcast at gmail.com. If you want to send um, uh, a note through Facebook or Instagram, you can contact us there as well. It's just prove me wrong is the name of the show. If you are looking for more just ways to listen to the podcast, you can find us on really any podcast platform Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, SoundCloud, iTunes, Anchor, uh, really anywhere where you can find podcasts, you can find the prove me wrong podcast. Like and subscribe to the show, and you'll be notified when a brand new episode is released. We typically release them every month, or every week, I'm sorry. So once a week, you'll be notified when a brand new episode comes out, and um, you can be the first on your block to listen. We're also on YouTube, and we're on Rumble as well, rumble.com. It's a brand new uh, video site as well. So we're on both of those. You can find us on YouTube or Rumble. Like and subscribe to the Prove Me Wrong page. And once again, you'll be notified when a brand new episode releases. Before we go tonight, the Prove Me Wrong podcast is brought to you by Zendo Zone Citronella Burners from J.T. Eaton. They're shaped like fearless bug repellent tiki gods. And I have one right here. There he is. I'm not sure if that's Surf and Stan. I think that might be Surf and Stan. But uh, let Surf and Stan, Hawaiian Howie, and Luau Lily bring the islands to your backyard with Zendo Zone Citronella Burners. Zendozone uses natural 3% citronella candles and incense cones, and they are perfect for patios, decks, backyards, campsites, poolside, and more. You can enjoy the outdoors again. Once again, they are available on Amazon.com and at select Ace Hardware stores, so collect them all today. So again, my guest tonight was author Lisa Morton. Her book is Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween. She has 150 short stories. You can find her online, lisamorton.com, and you can also buy her books on amazon.com. So once again, for the Prove Me Wrong podcast, this is Pete Lee. We'll talk to you again soon.